In these sections, you will learn the basic concepts of layout and design that designers commonly use. These will include the use of grids, internal structures, white spaces, element and text alignment, interactions and transitions of objects, and some basics about acceptable parameters of user interface and animation performance. Let's first focus on layouts and structures. Most designs should be organized in grids. Grids are invisible components that are, so to say, behind the page, and they define the page's structure. When you work with designers and receive layouts, most of the time, full or at least parts of the layouts will be set to an invisible grid. In this case, you can see a 12-column grid. And when you put elements on it, you can see how they align neatly to the grid, regardless of their size. Without the grid, it's very easy to mess up the layout and even a small misalignment of page elements make the whole page look chaotic and out of place. Why do designers use grids? Well, grids provide predictability, uh, structure and organization for the user. So even when you navigate between the pages, everything stays the same and it's neatly aligned. And of course, it makes it a lot easier for designers to design as well as for developers to develop within this uh, neatly structured arrangement. When we go a little deeper into the internal structure of elements on a page, additional rules apply. Here we have a simple card for Major Tom. He's an astronaut, of course. This card is made of various elements, and these elements are equally spaced. In this case, for example, they are 30 pixels apart. So the white box, which could represent Major Tom's picture, is 30 pixels from the top and as well fr from the sides, uh, and of course from the bottom to his name. In addition, the fonts are usually aligned against their baseline. So in this example, there is a 30 pixel space between the bottom of the letter M in Major and the bottom of the letter P in PhD Astronaut. In essence, you can imagine there are little perfect 30 by 30 pixel squares that are holding this particular layout in place. Also important to note is the concept of white space. Let's take a typical parking sign as an example. A normal parking sign looks something like this. And here's another version of that parking sign. The letter P in both cases is the same size and so you might wonder how come the cities simply don't use the smaller panel and save tons of money? Since the letter P is the same size, you might argue that the information the sign carries is the same. And so why do we use the big one and why is the big one better? Well, it's simple. The reason is that the parking sign is actually a construct of two elements, not just one. The first element is the letter P in the center and another is the free area around or the white space around the, the P, which helps us focus and transmit the message of the letter itself. If there is no white space around it, it would, it would feel cluttered. You can imagine if this sign was placed in front of a blue building or any other busy background without the white space to remove the visual clutter, the P would be completely unnoticeable. The white space around the letter P allows the central piece of content to actually function. It visually separates it from the other obje objects and backgrounds. White spaces are an essential design element. So let's say you have two cards, one for Major Tom and the other one for Sergeant Bob. If they are completely adjacent to each other, it becomes confusing. Why are they touching? Is it just one piece of information or is this actually two pieces of information? So we need to start splitting these two elements apart. If we split them a little, this probably isn't enough white space between the two elements. And they really are still too close to each other. So we need to space them up a little bit more. Yeah, now this is good. However, be aware that you actually can have too much white space. And we start to perceive this white space as a separate element, and in this case, it becomes a third object between these two elements. So in other words, you can really have too much white space. 
just as important as the white space is alignment of elements. Symmetry and organization are two concepts that are fundamental to good alignment. The way our brains are hardwired is that we perceive symmetry as beauty and we recognize neatness and good organization of things as trustworthy. Let's talk about the appearance of trustworthiness. There was a study conducted a while ago with two ATMs at a shopping mall. The ATMs were one next to each other, literally nearly touching each other, identical and from the same bank. But for this experiment, they scuffed up one of them. They banged it a little bit, they scratched the screen, hammered it a little bit with a, with a hammer, and they left the other one sparkling clean. The result was that the people were willing to spend more time queuing behind the clean ATM, while the other ATM was completely unused at all. This, pro this proved that the point of appear appearance for the ATM was just as important uh, as its function and that people in general will perceive items that are neat in appearance as more trustworthy. As humans, we are symmetrical in structure and we perceive symmetry as beauty. Good example of this can be found in Hollywood and you might have noticed that most actors and models have symmetrical faces. It's done on purpose. So let's talk about alignment and take into account the two concepts of symmetry and organization. One of the most common alignments you will see is left alignment. And you can think of it as an element inside another element and you need to assure that the spacing from the top and bottom and of course on the left are equal. The same would hold true for fonts if you have something like an input box that holds the text. For central alignment, items should be aligned on all sides, top, bottom, left and right. And of course for right alignment, if you have a button or an icon, something like a search icon inside of a search field, make sure that the icon is neatly aligned with the sp equal spacings top, bottom and of course on the right. Same concept would apply in cross page alignment. If you look at this graphic, it looks like we have a neat alignment on the left side of the screen, but if we look across to the right side of the screen, occasionally those elements fall out of alignment. Therefore, it's important to keep an eye for that and align them properly where required, either along the top, central or bottom line. Text alignment can differ from one design to another. However, in most cases, text will be aligned on the bottom baseline of the text. And then, simply as a general, general rule, alignment of the objects is more important than their pixel perfect size. For example, if you have a button and the button has an icon inside of it. If an icon is 10 pixels rather than 12 pixels big, most designers wouldn't complain about this. However, what they will complain about and more likely raise an issue if the icon is misaligned within the button itself. Of course, ideally, both would be preferred, a perfect alignment and a correct, perfect pixel size. Let's talk about interaction rule. The basic interaction rule is that it, if something is clickable, it should actually show that it's clickable. For example, the cursor, the cursor should change to a hand when the user hovers over a button. Of course, it's important to signal to the user that something is happening on click as well. Simple example would be when the cursor is outside of the button, it's in a shape of a cursor. And then when it hovers over, over a button or any other clickable element, it changes to a hand. And when the button is clicked, the button itself could change color. Any clickable element should have a clear design on how it looks and reacts in all of those three stages. Another important design element are transitions. If a user interface element appears or moves onto a screen, make sure to transition. Remember, nothing in life happens instantaneously and even the speed of light has its limits. When you call 
an elevator, it comes to your floor and the doors don't just slam open. There is a transition as these doors open. So keep this in mind. If an element appears, fade it in. And when it disappears, fade it out. But of course, don't get too creative with the fade-ins and fade-outs since it can easily result in becoming a turn-off. For example, if it takes too long or the animation is all sorts of wacky. If elements scale, then scale them. Don't just make them appear in their new size. If something moves across the screen, then move it. Don't just hide it in one place and show it in another place. If items are generated, show this generation, and so on. Another rule to remember is to avoid the unexpected. For example, if you have a box like this that says open on the right side with an arrow going to the right, when the user selects open, don't open the box downward and have, then have the close appear arbitrarily on the left side. The expectation would be that the box opens to the right. The transitions should follow that visu visual. Unexpected designs <laughs> put people in hospital. This might look like a juice. It has fruit images on it and it's nice and red. But when you take a closer look, you will find that this is actually a multi-purpose cleaner. Let's be very careful in embracing the unexpected when it comes to design. One important topic of user experience is performance. This relates to the screen response and user interface response. In UI, we are always expecting less than 100 milliseconds response time. So from the time the user clicks on something or starts to drag something, or there is some sort of a UI interaction, or the UI needs to respond, it has to be done within 0.1 of a second. Within this time, the user feels like they are in control of the interaction on screen. Anything above that adds this sort of a machine feel to it. And anything above one second response feels like something is completely wrong with the interface. Of course, way above one second is just dead zone. Let's just not, not even go there. Some of you might rise an eyebrow now, but it's impossible to have everything respond within you know, point 0.1 of a second. Yes, that's true, but what's important to note is that the user interface response is not the same as the overall application response, particularly data loading. So popping a window is not the same as showing data in that window. So for example, we have a button and when you click on it, a pop-up will appear but the data can load inside of it later. So showing up this pop-up is decoupled from, from data loading inside of this pop-up. When the user clicks on a button, the UI should respond immediately, open up, and then fetch the data in the background and display it in the pop-up. One idea is to use the transition time to fetch the data so that the users don't have time to proce process the lag in data retrieval. Simply use the fade-in animation to fetch the data. However, we should always strive to make the response time instantaneous. But if that's not possible, the UI should at least respond immediately by displaying something on screen, keeping the user occupied for a while, while the data is being fetched. If you are bridging loading time with animation and all other transitions, the ideal situation is that every animation on screen is done in 60 frames per second. You might ask, why is this the case? Well, it has to do with how we humans perceive motion, which is explained by the persistence of vision and what we call the fee phenomenon, and by the natural restriction built in the browsers themselves. Let's take a closer look at the persistence of vision and the fee phenomenon. When you look at this image, it looks like the green dot is moving in a circle in a clockwise motion. Two things are happening here. First is the burn-in effect on your eye retinas, which cause the effect of the green circle when there is no green circle to begin with. And second is optical illusion of perceiving continuous motion 
between separate objects viewed rapidly in succession. You know nothing is actually moving here. It's just that the dot is appearing at one place and then appearing in another. But this sequence makes your brain perceive the whole thing as motion. Combining the effect of your retinas having a burnt-in image, which came previously, with the rapid succession of the next image, which comes after it, the brain starts to think and stitch together this and perceive motion. When we talk about perceived motion, we need to talk about frame rate. At 12 frames per second, it's absolute minimum, and anything below that is actually recognized as simply individual images. At 16 frames per second, it's still not good enough. Users can see the visual stutter, and this can cause headaches for many people. 24 frames per second is the minimum speed for perceiving motion, and of course, Hollywood uses it and all the movie making because it's cost efficient. Uh, this is the film, this is the frame rate at which most movies are made. More and more movies nowadays are made at 30 frames per second, and it's better as the images move much faster and the result is much crisper. At 48 frames per second, the image gets even clearer. The movie The Hobbit was filmed in this frequency of 48 frames per second, and you maybe heard some controversy about it, uh, that the speed the images are moving almost make the whole thing look too real. It looks like you are in an opera or a theater instead of movie. To some, the speed is too lifelike, and some people are less likely to be fooled into illusion of cinema. In other words, they could see actors and not characters, they could see costumes and not outfits. But for browser transitions, even higher, 60 frames per second is ideal. So if 60 frames per second is ideal for a browser, why are most movies still filmed in 20 form? And why is this still accepted? If you look at this picture, you can see that some items on the screen are sharp, while others are blurred. This is called a motion blur. A motion blur helps our brain stitch the image together into a single fluid motion by increasing the surface of an object. Unfortunately, motion blur is not supported and not available at the moment in browsers or CSS. Browsers simply render elements as they move on screen in their true pixels. They are not able to blur them. So here you can see how this looks in a browser. The top ball is moving at 24 frames per second. The middle one has a motion blur added to it, and the lower one is moving at 60 frames per second. All three balls are taking two seconds from one edge to the other. However, the ball at 60 frames per second looks much smoother than the other two, simply because there are more steps squeezed together in the same time frame. The motion itself is described much better. In summary, in this section, you have learned about the importance of grids in page layouts, spacing of internal objects, the role of white space and element alignments, and the basics of interactions and transitions, as well as the basic principles of UI performance and screen animation. In this trio of videos, we're going to look at a strategy for being able to evaluate and critique designs that is extremely powerful and cost-effective. The strategy is called heuristic evaluation or heuristic-based feedback. And what I like about this is that there's, of course, lots of ways to evaluate user interface designs. You can evaluate them empirically. You can use formal models. You can have automated software measures. And what we're going to talk about here is being able to use expertise and heuristic feedback to be able to critique designs. One reason that I like heuristic evaluation so much is that you can use these heuristics to talk about designs throughout the entire design process. So you don't need to wait until you've built software. You can do this very early on with a paper prototype. Um, as you're starting to build things, 
You can give these heuristics to users so they have the vocabulary to talk about what's effective. You can give it to your manager. Everybody on the design team can use these heuristics. You can also use these before redesigning. So after you've released software and you're thinking about making a new version, heuristic evaluation is great as a way of going through the post-mortem of what you might want to do next. These heuristics were originally developed by Jacob Nielsen uh, around 1990. And what they've been used most commonly for is you get a couple of people together who walk through a user interface, and they look for instances of design that violate the 10 heuristics we'll walk through in these sections. Then you can get together, sync up about what you found, and decide which are the most important to go forward with from there. The 10 heuristics that we're going to look at in these videos cover a wide swath of different user interface features, and I think will give you a useful vocabulary. The last thing to say before we dive in is that there's nothing magic in particular about this set of 10. Uh, I've revised them based on uh, my own experience from the original ones that Jacob Nielsen came up with. And if you have a different kind of software than the kind of things that Jacob or I had in mind, you can add, remove, or change these heuristics to suit your needs. Uh, but here is a launching point for being able to do effective user interface critique, are 10 heuristics for good design. We'll cover them in three groups, helping users understand your interface, helping users act, and providing feedback about what the system's done. Let's look at how you can make your interface more understandable. We build our mental representations and expectations based on experience. And for that reason, it's important to be consistent, both within your software and with similar software that other users may have experience with. Here's an example of something that violates the consistency principle. With this version of Microsoft Visual Basic, there were four different places that you could put the dialog box buttons. And there's no good reason for that. Sometimes, of course, you will break consistency. But here, it's just sloppy. In this Verizon customer service page, the names that were used as part of contacting customer service were probably names of the business units. But that wasn't any of the user-facing language that was elsewhere on the site. And so it's difficult to know if you'd like to get your USB data modem service, whether you are part of mobile web or national access, for example. Here's an example from the Adobe License Repair Utility. You see here at the bottom, I blacked out a little bit of the interface. And what do you think is there? Well, normally you would think it means continue. But in fact, here it says, do you wish to cancel? The first time I ran this, I clicked yes to continue before having fully read this. And of course, it exited me out, and I had to start over. Here's a wonderful example of using consistency and offering clarity that in this dialog box, it asks you a question. And then the buttons, as opposed to being yes, no, which might be hard to map, use the same terms that we see up at the top of the dialog box. This brings us to our second heuristic of using familiar metaphors and language. Here's a really great example from the Adobe Acrobat uh, print dialog box. It uses the metaphor of a world in miniature. The graphical user face, in general, draws its power through its analogy to the physical world. In this print dialog box, we see a world in miniature of the page that we're about to print. That page happens to be legal-sized, but we have letter-sized paper set. We're alerted to that by the fact that we get the grayed out area along the bottom. Some other familiar metaphors that you can use are the desktop, folders, a shopping cart. These are all things that we're familiar with in the physical world and also what they mean in the digital world. And if you're designing for a particular user group, speak their language. This is a nice example of a web page for kids where the language is very kid friendly. This is a fun example that I came across when getting a visa to travel to India. The visa web application lists more than 50 states in the US, and it distinguishes, in particular, Southern California and Northern California. Now, I've lived in both places, and I can say that many Californians do wish that the state were separated. Currently, it's a single state, and many of us are sure which part we live in. But it is unexpected. And I can imagine if you live in between, you wouldn't know which one to select. 
nor should you need to. In fact, in many cases, a state dropdown should be obviated by the zip code. And that kind of streamlining is our next heuristic, to have clean, functional design. Le Corbusier famously said that form follows function. So your layout should be driven by what people would like to do. Uh, this is an example of the Weather Channel from 2012, where, I mean, the reason you go to get the weather for San Francisco is because you want to know the weather for San Francisco. None of that is above the fold. All of the things that you actually need are below the fold if you get there. Here's an amazing example, which is so remarkable, it's so bad, that I, I think it's, it's, it's actually pretty good, but probably not quite what you want. This is a car rental place where uh, there's all sorts of crazy going on. This is an extreme example, of course, but if you're not careful, there can be a lot of different things going on, and users won't be able to focus on what they care about. A more mundane example of not dealing with the signal-to-noise ratio is this Google form I encountered in 2010. Uh, here, there's a lot of these old web um, boxes around all of the cells. Of course, all, that's all chart junk. You know, you, what you really want to see is the content of the form itself. Get rid of those extra lines. And lastly, it can be a really strong impulse in organizations to be able to add value to whatever you're doing. Sometimes that takes away from the core user needs. For example, on this student loan website, what you want to be able to do is find your loan balance, pay your loan, make sure your address is up to date, all of that kind of stuff. Somebody thought it'd be a good idea to add widgets, but nobody spends that much time on their student loan website, and what kind of widget would you add anyhow? So this wraps up our heuristics on helping users understand your interface. The next session will cover heuristics related to action. Welcome to this second set of heuristics. In this section, we're going to look at design heuristics for what users can do. First among these is user control and freedom. When I come to a site, is the set of things that I can possibly do clear? Is it large enough to encompass what I want to do? And do I know how I can accomplish that? This encompasses a number of things like exits from mistaken choices, the ability to undo and then redo, and not forcing people down fixed paths. So for example, if I come to an e-commerce site, I probably want to explore before I'm forced to log in and address, uh, add an address, stuff like that. The kind of interface that you want is going to be somewhat dependent on what the task will be. So something that I only do once every couple of years, maybe set up a router or a printer or other configuration kind of tasks that happen only rarely, in that case, probably a more constrained wizard is going to be a much better choice, whereas things that happen all the time or where the set of things that I might want to do is larger, there it's going to be important to be able to have a large number of alternative paths available. Also, the more expert somebody is, the more it makes sense to leave the doors wide open. The more novice somebody is for that task in particular, the more that you'll want to constrain things. So in a good checkout system, for example, early on in the process, you'll want the ability to bounce around, add a bunch of things. When you get into the final part of the funnel, then the options start to shut, and you're really encouraged to check out. And I think Amazon, as we see here, does a really good job of this. Because even in the checkout stage, you can remove items from your cart before placing the final order. And uh, I think checkout funnels are an interesting example of freedom and the balance between the more wizard-focused path and the more open-ended path. Because if you have it be too focused, people will just quit. Oh, I didn't want that. I'm going to give up. Uh, of course, if it's too open-ended, people might wander off and do something else, forgetting that they were about to check out. So all of this is a balance. Here's a good example of providing freedom to users in the context of browsing for airline tickets. What I like about this interface is that there are a number of ways that you can browse through the options. In particular, it's nice to be able to see the other date options that are close to your initial selection. Uh, so for example, if I'm looking for a flight on a particular day 
And it says, well, but if you fly the day before, it's half the price, or there are many more options, or you'll have a lot more flexibility. That's nice to know. And those previews of alternative channels is something that sites like this do well. Related to that, the next heuristic that we're going to look at is flexibility. Good interfaces offer flexible and efficient paths for experts. Classic example of this is keyboard shortcuts. That command, copy, paste, if I know the, uh, the menu options there, it's a lot easier to do that. One way of accomplishing this flexibility without having novices be lost entirely is to offer good defaults with options. Uh, here's an example that uh, the Expedia Hotel Search has used, where you can type in any city you want, so it's flexible. But the cities that people most commonly go to, uh, such as San Francisco, Boston, DC, those are available as a radio button. This flexibility can also take form as ambient information, that I can often make better decisions if I have a little bit of context about what's going on. Here's an example of the BusyCal calendar program, where it shows at the top of each day what the weather for that day is going to be. That can be helpful in figuring out whether to bicycle or to drive, uh, whether you need to bring a raincoat, and that just gives you one more bit of information to make good decisions. One powerful way to combat information overload is that we get some help from the tools that we work with. And Google's Gmail does this in a number of interesting ways. Uh, this is an example of how you might be able to unsubscribe from meetings that if you click on report spam for something where Google knows how to unsubscribe you, it realizes you don't want messages like that. And as opposed to just doing what you literally asked it to do, it says, well, you might want to do this. Those kinds of you might want to are really excellent, as long as they don't come too often or start to feel uh, like they're getting in the way of what you're trying to do. So we've seen how an airline site can show you alternate days for better prices or times. We've seen how a calendar site can show you the weather for ambient information. Collaborative filtering or recommender systems are another path for flexibility. So if you like this particular soda, you may also be interested in this other soda. One caveat to building recommender systems and other algorithmically generated suggestions is that if the algorithms aren't good, then it can be really embarrassing. And so on some e-commerce sites, you'll see comments, suggestions, other algorithmically curated content that just seems completely random, uh, occasionally even offensive to some users. And we have the SAP site, which often does a really good job of keeping content that's relevant. However, many of these posts are generic. Uh, and if you have a specific goal, these more generic posts can be kind of a distraction. And so it, it's a balance between having content that is relevant, but one that's also related to your task. Difficult to do algorithmically, requires trial and error and prototyping, like so many things in design. Here's a fashion example of how, if you'd like to be able to unsubscribe from an email list uh, because you're getting emails too frequently, um, one option that the site might give you is, well, you're getting these emails quite frequently from us. Would you still like to get emails just less frequently than before? That's a way of offering users some choice in what they're getting. And the third action heuristic that we're going to explore today is recognition over recall. The insight of recognition over recall is bedrock to user interface design. It's a mouthful, but what it really means is that what you're able to do is clear based on the interface that you're shown, that you don't have to remember what the red button means or what the something else means. Uh, for our research group one day, we got uh, uh, sandwiches that were all wrapped in tinfoil, and they each came with a numerical code. And we had to look up from the code whether it was falafel or chicken or beef or something else. Uh, and here it's just a fun, silly example from our research meeting. But it's a nice pedagogical example in terms of you can't just grab a sandwich. You need to do a referral to some index system to understand what it means.
Many interfaces have this attribute too, where it can be difficult to know just from looking at it whether uh, what that particular button or control or link will accomplish. And this benefit of recognition over recall is one reason that strategies like speaking navigation, where links have larger blocks of text as opposed to trying to pare it down, often test better in terms of the user experience. So when you have navigation, it should present enough context that you can understand what's available. That doesn't mean add lots of extra steps. And so a challenge of, of poor navigation on some sites is that it's broken down into steps that don't necessarily make sense. Like in this movie Showtime's example, it's not clear why we need a completely separate path to purchase tickets for today versus for to purchase tickets for a tomorrow or a future date. You could imagine, in fact, we see this in the airline example, just put the calendar right on the opening buy tickets page. It can default to a reasonable date, which might be today for movie tickets, and then you can change it if you want to. One powerful way that you can make people recognize what they're looking at in an interface as opposed to having to remember or look up or actually open it in an interface is to have good previews. That if you have icons or thumbnails that show the actual content, then you can recognize a particular document. So this wraps up our video about action. Uh, join me for the next video where we'll talk about how to provide users with good feedback. When you're using an interface, how do you know what just happened from the feedback that the system provides to you? In the real world, the feedback often happens naturally. You bounce a ball, you see it come back up. But in the computational world, we're designing what it is that the user sees and hears. And it's often difficult, if you're not paying attention, to provide that good feedback. But there's several strategies for doing a good job, and it's extremely important. To start off, Show what the status of the system is. If you have an interaction that happens almost immediately, a lot of the feedback is simply showing the current state. So if you've got a flow, you're just at the current state of the design. Now, how much feedback you need will depend on response time. Under a second, just show the outcome. If it takes about a second, it's useful to have some indicator of status so that you know the computer didn't just get stuck. Uh, on a web browser, for example, this is the spinning dial that, that shows up in the tab. But this could just as easily be the hourglass or a spinning ball or a progress icon, anything that moves the, where the pixels change on the screen so that you know that something is happening. If it takes more than a second, it's useful to have some level of progress be shown. And this could be a circular progress bar that shows up to 100%. This could be a linear progress bar. It could be a countdown timer. Once you get more than a couple of seconds, it can be useful to have an actual countdown timer, uh, in part because users know that the progress bars don't always proceed uh, linearly with respect to time, uh, or you want to know, again, whether things got stuck. You know, Should I go off and have lunch, or should I just wait 10 more seconds? In the late 80s, I used the very first version of Photoshop where often uh, on an early color Mac, it could take 20 minutes for an image operation to, to happen. And so it was nice to know some operations were relatively quick, but others could take a very long time. And it really would be, you know, you'd go get lunch and come back and it would be done and then you could move forward. Same thing for time, you could show for space. So if uh, your webmail system shows you how much of your inbox you've used, that's nice because as you get close, you can start to decide to do something about it. If all of a sudden you get a surprise, you're out of space, that's really frustrating. Part of showing the system status is what are the options that are available based on what I have done. So if I close a document, it's useful for it to say, hey, you've made changes. The status of the document is that it's been changed. And you have three options. And in this dialog box here, you see how each of those names is clear with respect to what will happen. By the way, one other bit of good user interface design here that you see is that the Save button is blue, which means it's the default button. 
Uh, it's the button that'll happen when you press the return key. Also, the save button has three dots after it. And those three dots mean that something else will happen. So with uh, don't save, there's no additional dialog box. With cancel, there's no additional dialog box. But with save, those three dots mean click on me, and there will be another dialog where you'll further parameterize this interaction. Traffic lights, classic example of showing state. And traffic lights show state usefully by having a redundant code. The redundant code in the case of the traffic light, that the red light up top is both red and it's up top. That can be useful for times where the color is hard to see because of lighting, or in particular for users who may be colorblind. If one of those codes is unavailable, you can always use the other. The way that feedback connects to action is that it's nice to show after you've done an action where you are and what the next step might be. So you sign up for a mailing list, and it doesn't just say, great, you've signed up. It actually says, OK, you've signed up. And now the next thing that you can do is this thing. And that helps move people along in the process, because people often don't know what they can do next. And of course, once something is done, to let, let you know that it's complete for long interactions, then you want to have maybe even a dialog box that comes up. Here's a really playful one from the um, video tool called Handbrake. Good feedback can really help you prevent errors. We were looking at a save dialog box earlier. Uh, this is one that I really like. If you're about to save a file, and that file already exists, uh, this Adobe dialog box gives you four options. It's impressive both because you get the choices that are relevant, but also because they're named really well. So if it says, hey, this file already exists, what would you like to do? Would you like to overwrite that file? Would you like to skip writing that file for now? Would you like to cancel out of this export interaction completely? Or would you like to use unique names? So we'll give this one a dash 2.jpg at the end. One way that you can improve in, in a dialog box like this is we might show you a thumbnail of what that picture looks like and what your picture looks like. And here we see a dialog box that does some of uh, the work, but not enough. That the Adobe dialog box gave me a number, number of options. Here with this Mac dialog box, it just says, hey, uh, you can't do that. And of course, what would be really nice in this Mac case is to have the options that were available to me in the Lightroom case. One impediment to good feedback is overly generic names. In the last video, uh, we talked a little bit about how speaking navigation, using more wordy links with icons, can help people know what lies beyond. Here's a dialog box with three options, which on their face seem pretty good. Would you like to save the changes you made to this presentation? We can choose Don't Save, Cancel, or Save. They seem like pretty normal options. Save clearly makes sense. It's also the default, probably rightfully so. But what's the difference between Don't Save and Cancel? I'm actually not entirely sure in this case, and I think many users wouldn't be either. If Cancel here means close without saving or something like that, then we probably should have a button labeled Close Without Saving. And if Cancel here means exactly the same thing as Don't Save, we'll just escape you out of the dialog sequence, and, uh, and you go back to where you were, then we probably don't need those two different buttons. A really important part of feedback is what are the set of things that the system uh, expects or allows me to fill in? A find dialog is a classic example of something that has several parameters. So if I'm trying to find text like this and replace it with text like this, um, we've got the top part of the dialog dog box, which has the find part, and then a lower section for the replacing with several options there. This is where the graphical user interface uh, starts to really shine, that in the ter terminal, uh, if you know that the find command can be used for, for finding things, um, you have to remember the syntax for what command flags you use to specify the different parts of, of finding, and that can be a real pain. Of course, in both cases, you need an ability to specify a wildcard, 
and letting users know what kinds of wildcard and flexibility can be put into a find command can be a little bit tricky. But the graphical UI gives you way better scaffolding than the terminal does. Also, in the graphical user interface, it is difficult to make syntax errors because the physical structure of the dialog box and the things that you can type into and press mean that you can't have a, you entered something nonsensical. Whereas in a command line system, if you uh, type a flag that doesn't exist or enter in a malformed expression, it will just barf on grounds that what you tried to give me wasn't a reasonable command to give. And so a benefit of graphical user interfaces from a feedback perspective is that they omit the possibility of syntax errors. Lots of other errors can still happen, just not syntax errors. That doesn't mean that you always want to provide as many constraints as possible. Here's an example of a user interface where the constraints actually get in the way of the task rather than help. I was searching my, for my friend and colleague Dan Olson's book. So I typed Olson into this search field, and I hit Enter, hoping that it would give me a list of his books and I could select among them. However, what happens is that a list of catalogs appears. So the publisher has different catalogs, which is something that they care about, but probably you don't care about most of the time. But in this case, you need to select a catalog first before you then and go see which books contain uh, something authored by Dan Olson. And that uh, intermediary is just completely unnecessary in this context. So you want to have constraints when they help and not when they hurt. And the constraints and options you offer should be ones that are uh, syntactically possible and that make sense given the particular context. Here's a calendaring interface where you can ask for a meeting time. But if you forget to fill out the days, uh, both start and end, uh, it throws up a syntax error that says, hey, you didn't specify that. It seems like it would be a lot better to either um, if you try to hit Create without specifying days, it pops up a, cat, a, a calendar widget. Or in some cases, it might make sense to have some default days that you start with, which you can then change if needed. Similarly, if there are kinds of input like the airplane doesn't fly on Thursday or the room isn't bookable on Sundays, then that probably shouldn't be an option that's available. Those should either be removed from the option set or grayed out. Good user interface design and feedback can eliminate probably 90% of user errors or even more. But there's no way you can uh, remove 100% of them. Life happens, you know, all sorts of stuff. So when errors do happen, it's important to make the problem clear so that you can help the user recover from that error. This is an error that, in my opinion, is not very helpful. Uh, it says, hey, error creating virtual directory. Um, the unknown error has the following hex code. This is a little better than it looks, because what a lot of people have figured out to do is that you take that hex code and type it into Google, and you can find information there. Uh, that inspired a, a research project of my group on opportunistic programming, where we use the web browser as part of the programming interface. But here, uh, you could at least have a hyperlink. And gosh, if we know a little bit about what that hex code is, Maybe you could give me an English language summary of what that might be. The lack of helpful feedback probably shows up more in form filling than any other task, where here's a common error that I'm sure you've all seen. It says you must fill out all the required fields. Usually, when the user gets to this point, they didn't realize that something that they uh, didn't put in wasn't required, if that triple negative makes sense. So, if I'm filling out a form and I click Go, usually I either think that I've filled out everything, or at least that I've filled out all the stuff that I needed to, or at least that i filled out all the stuff that I knew the answer to. It's possible I missed a field, just by whatever, or misunderstood what was required or not. But simply telling me, hey, buddy, you didn't fill out all the required fields, that doesn't help. So how could you make that better? Well, one thing that you could do is you could show people what they just filled out, where you bold and highlight and make super obvious. Uh, hey, you can even put an arrow around the side of the screen. I need you to add your city. Great, that I can do. Uh, or um, 
we need you to specify your organization. If you don't have one, check this dialog box. Or alternatively, you could just say, uh, hey, we need to fill out your city and then inline that particular single element that's missing. So there are a number of ways that you can guide people to the specific thing that you need them the information from uh, without just saying you didn't do it right. And this Facebook sign up shows one example of that, where here, if I try to fill in nothing, just as an example, uh, pedagogically, and click sign up, it puts a red box around all the things that I missed. It puts a big red exclamation point around them also. So we have two codes showing that. That way I won't miss the same thing again. And it puts a big arrow by the first one that I should start out with. And so it gives me a nice on-ramp to get going. This dialog box of some files could not be created uh, is probably not something anybody wants to see. But what it does do a good job of, even if it's medicine that I probably don't want to hear, is it tells me, please do the following things. Close the applications, reboot, and then commence the uh, installation again. So it gives me a path forward. That's extremely important. For search user interfaces, sometimes when you can't find anything, uh, it's nice to know, hey, remember to check the spelling, try more general terms, use synonyms, stuff like that. This is a good uh, user interface. Without a doubt, a better user interface would be to say, uh, you typed Scott with one T. That didn't give us anything, so here's some examples of Scott with two Ts. Or you searched for a specific instance Here's a more general instance. So if you're doing a geo search, it might automatically broaden the area that it's searching. Or we automatically check the synonyms. And so when the system can actually go the extra mile and check one step further along for you and show those as an examples of things that you might want, that's a great path for error recovery. Some errors or problems may be things that we don't even realize. This is the challenge of phishing on the web. Firefox and other browsers these days do a nice job of, if you go to a site that has been reported as a bad actor, even if you don't realize it, you know, Facebook with one O or something like that is a secret hacker site, it will flag that for you and say, you may not realize it, but this situation is dicey. And of course, you, you can, uh, there's a text in the lower right corner where you can say, no, no, I know what I'm doing, which is sometimes necessary to do. But the prominent stuff is, get out of here, what's going on, why am I being fished? And that's a nice, nice segue into our last heuristic, which is to provide useful help. It can be easy in a development team to think about help as somebody's problem and not part of the real app. I think we're fortunate things have gotten a lot better in recent years that web help and documents and applications have all blurred together more with the web. So it's not as bad as it used to be in the desktop software era. But still, it can be easy for help to be an afterthought, and you don't want to do that. One kind of help that I think is especially powerful, especially for technical things like programming, is to show examples. And, and PHP has done this for years. They say, OK. Uh, as opposed to just giving you a dictionary of all the syntax of the language, we'll show you common ways that people use this particular function, what it gets combined with, how you set the parameters, all that stuff. It's really great. And here's an example from Adobe Lightroom, where the user is searching for information on how to expose their image, and the program provides the most relevant information, along with showing the most relevant menu path. By contrast, one kind of task that seems like it's providing information, but in fact is doing anything but, are end user license agreements. I think that the way that EULAs are treated by software today is totally morally bankrupt and certainly a usability disaster, probably even intentionally so. The problem, of course, is that when you get a giant EULA, uh, nobody's going to scroll all the way through. People don't understand most of the language. They're just trying to do something else. They don't care. And so the system disingenuously shows you this big, massive thing, forces you to click Agree. And then it's like, hey, you agreed to the terms, so we can do whatever we want now. Uh, and I think that's just crazy. And I think a much better example, like what we see here, comes from 
Creative Commons. And so what the uh, nonprofit Creative Commons has done is that creating licenses is a real challenge. You know, there's a reason that there's all that text in the EULA. But that doesn't mean that people need to see all of the text all of the time. So Creative Commons has these short summaries, and then they have the much longer legalese version that explains what the short summary means for the nine people who care. Uh, and then they have a code version that makes that EULA executable. And I think that's a much more effective path forward. And I hope that all of you out there adopt that strategy for EULAs. And lastly, to end on a more positive note, uh, I think you can really help people have fun. Here's a hotel website where, as part of declaring if you have an allergy, one of the things that you can elect to rest your head on is a sympathetic shoulder. And so burying these little Easter eggs in apps can really make your site be a lot more fun and organic. And there have been a bunch of people who have done this for uh, page not found errors recently. I think every year they get more and more clever. And it's kind of a fun inside joke uh, across the web. So now you've got these 10 design heuristics in your arsenal. And you can use them to think about what designs you, you might try to be able to talk about the relative merits of different designs. I mean, these heuristics are great when you are in a design team discussion or you're talking with clients about different choices. Extremely powerful. Uh, I found them super useful in my career, and I hope you do too. Happy designing.